bond market starting to sell off a little bit again as we saw global growth revisions higher from the IMF. Joining me, Jeff Kleintop is a perfect man for the job this morning. He's the chief global investment strategist at Charles Schwab. Jeff, great to have you. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Always. Uh, all right. So IMF ups our uh, forecast generally. I mean, I guess that's uh, in vogue and makes sense. Yeah, the IMF and the World Bank aren't generally leaders when it comes to the trends in economic movements. They usually follow uh, for a variety of different reasons, and they only update their forecast usually once every six months or so. So, yeah, this is a reflection of what we already know. Not only is U.S. economic growth really uh, continuing to come in surprising on the upside, but global economic growth is as well. We've noted the manufacturing recovery that's been kicking in around the world, particularly in the last couple of months. And all this has been signaled by commodity prices. Almost anywhere you want to look, we've seen a pretty strong rise in commodities, Dr. Copper, aluminum, uh, zinc, you name it, all these industrial metals showing that uptick in industrial activity, something we just didn't see at all last year. Now, uh, as we look for commentary from our central bankers, Jerome Powell, his Canadian counterpart today, what's kind of your baseline for that conversation? Well, there's a little bit of a tiff. Ha, uh, Tiff Macklem, ha, uh, just a reference to the BOC <laughs> head. Look, uh, the Bank of Canada is going to cut on June 5th. The Fed will not. That's not really a conflict or a tiff. It's just the fact that things are different in those two economies. Canada, very dependent on natural resources and global uh, manufacturing production. And, well, it's been weak. It's coming back, as I just mentioned, but it's still relatively soft. 50.6 on the global PMI for manufacturing. That's barely above the flat line. A lot better than the last 18 months, but still just beginning to turn around. So you're not seeing the same type of momentum in Canada's economy, nor the backdrop of inflation there, which is down uh, and actually probably going to be below the Bank of Canada's 2% target in the months ahead. Not true for the U.S. So very different trajectories, despite the fact that they share a very long border. Okay. Now, uh, the Canadians passed on the last opportunity to cut, but you're saying it's definitely going to happen in the summer or what's the odds there uh, i'd say it's going to happen in june the market's putting about a 60 to 70 percent odds on that i feel like that's even higher i'd put it maybe in the 85 percent range for that first cut on june 5th that's the next meeting for the boc of course the fed's got a couple got a lot uh, they can talk to us about between now and june there'll be a lot of data coming out but i think uh, the bank of canada has really seen a uh, very soft inflation surprising on the downside uh, that's encouraging wage growth has begun to slide in the last two months they've seen job losses so very different picture than the u.s again i think all that reiterates the need for rate cuts in canada very high probability of that happening on june 5th job loss is a key uh, distinction there here as our data keep impressing. Do you think uh, Powell will respond to any of the numbers that have come out since we last heard from him? Uh, I, I think he'll probably continue to, to um, comment on what they're looking for. You know, he's really shifted his perspective on what he's looking for. You know, for so long it was looking for weakness in the in the jobs picture. And now I think just, you know, moderation in some of the areas that are keeping inflation high, X jobs. So yeah, I, I think we'll hear from him. It could be market moving, but uh, I, I think just given the backdrop of inflation still remaining well north of, uh, of the Fed's target level, uh, I think he's going to find reasons to encourage the market to continue its thinking around two or three rate cuts, maybe later this year. He doesn't want to get the he doesn't want to signal the market that uh, it should move back towards three or four. I think he likes this flexibility and the ability to even surprise with an additional cut uh, versus what the market's currently forecasting of around two rate cuts. So yeah, I, I think he's going to continue that sort of uh, pushing things out uh, uh, environment and, uh, and, and likes that flexibility that the market's given him. Okay. All right. Now, uh, comparatively, the hawkishness or patience, however one wants to phrase it in the Fed's likely approach, having to deal with stickier inflation, having to deal with uh, good jobs data, do the Canadians at all have any possibility that they'll have to follow suit if crude oil prices keep going? I mean, that's a pretty big uh, force for their economy. And uh, a couple months away still, I mean, I don't know if crude gets to 90 bucks. Could those odds change of their cut? That's a very good point you bring up. The Alberta oil sands have led Canada into being a major producer of oil, and it's, it's a big part of what they do. And, and you know, things are thawing up a little bit, and there's maybe less activity right now in terms of, uh, of, of drilling. But 
that is certainly a catalyst for the Canadian economy. Natural resources is a lot of what they do, and many of the other industries uh, uh, feed off of that. So certainly there is a risk. A big boom in energy prices could lead to a big boom in Canada's economy and employment, and that could turn the picture around. That's not my expectation. You know, West Texas Intermediate, our benchmark uh, for crude prices here in the U.S., has just not had the ability to sustain much of a move over $85. Has it really sustainably got over $90 in a decade? Uh, and that's the kind of the price level where, as you indicated, would be a real boom for Canada. So obviously geopolitics can drive a lot of that and we'll continue to keep an eye on it. But it looks to me that oil prices are probably capped here near toward the high end of their range over the last 18 months. All right. OK, Jeff, thinking about geopolitics here, what have you learned over the last week about what matters? Speaking of energy producers, does our own uh, gushing oil supply uh, inoculate us at all from uh, Middle East geopolitical scares? You know, it does to some degree, certainly more so than what we've seen any time in the last 50, 60, even 70 years. The U.S. is now the world's biggest energy producer, without a doubt. We're even the biggest oil exporter, without uh, without a doubt, as we look around the world. And that's really made the big difference in our dependence on Mideast oil and threats to supplies in the Middle East. You combine that with tremendous excess capacity within OPEC, demand growth that is coming back, but still relatively slow. All that sets us up into a, a situation that I think is pretty good for the energy sector. I, you know, I, I, we continue to like the energy and materials sectors domestically and on a global basis. You know, since the ticked over 50, we've seen energy and materials as two of the three best performing sectors of the S&P 500 and MSCI World Indexes. So they've been doing really well. I think you've got a chart up here of gold prices, and I'll just jump to that for a second because we're focused on commodities. Certainly, we know geopolitical events can, can boost gold. Gold is more of a demand story. What you see here is this incredible run up in gold relative to other periods of geopolitical conflict, right? I've started this chart back when uh, Hamas uh, attacked Israel and you can see the incredible run. This outstrips most other major geopolitical events over the last 20 or 30 years in terms of gold's move to the upside. Gold's got uh, a lot of things going for it. Geopolitical risk, you've got lingering inflation in the US, so gold might be seen as a hedge. You've got an even stronger move up in silver. Silver is the most AI chip exposed metal. That might be helping to lift gold. And India's economy continues to boom. That's boosting jewelry demand in the world's top gold consuming country. So a lot of factors coming into place here. Another reason to think about uh, materials producers. All right. Uh, it's a good perspective on the timing for the gold move. It's almost like gold is caught more of a bid from some of the geopolitical stuff than crude oil itself. Uh, of course, we've got some stock volatility in the background, too. There's a lot going into our cocktail right now, right. but it seems like the main uh, taste we're getting is uh, a flavor for gold, <laughs> uh, which has been working. What about the central bank buying of gold? I've had a few guests that have talked about that as well, Jeff. Uh, how much transparency do we have into what China and Russia are doing? Now we can we can get a sense of what they're doing and, and track it through uh, through you know where their holdings are and where they keep it. But you know for the most part uh, we've actually seen um, yeah we've seen big buying there. At the same time we've seen some money coming out of the gold ETFs, right? And some of that money's gone to the crypto space. So sort of interesting to see how that shift has taken place and that still allowed gold to rise. So I think central banks are gonna continue to focus on adding to their gold reserves, uh, likely, although probably not a pace that will continue to, to uh, uh, provide this type of a lift. Remember, gold's been an asset for central banks for a long time. They've been adding to it for a long time. So this move we've seen lately isn't so much about central banks or isn't even about the ETF flows. This is much more about some of the things we just talked about, geopolitics, gold is a hedge, a lot of other factors in the backdrop there. Uh, but uh, many of those are still in place and we might continue to see this move despite hopefully some of the geopolitical risks settling down a little bit. All right. Jeff, great conversation as always. Excellent timing. Good setup for us as we watch the central bankers this afternoon. All right, Tiff and Thanks, Jay. Alan. Sounds like a new comic book. Jeff Kleintop, Chief Global Investment Strategist, Charles Schwab.